How do you organize a movement of people whose sole ideology is being left alone? I'm Sheila gunn reed and you're watching The Gun Show. You know, I've seen polls that say as high as one in two Albertans are expressing some form of independence sentiment. Now, that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, but I think it's probably true. I think 50% of us are absolutely disgruntled with our role in Confederation and our treatment by the federal government. In fact, I think the number might even be a little bit low. And I think it's the reason for new Premier Daniel Smith's Sovereignty Act, where the province of Alberta is now committed by law to fight back against federal government incursion into provincial jurisdiction. Now, there are also a handful of sovereigntists and independence movements and parties active here in Alberta, and sometimes they get along and sometimes they don't. But that also makes perfect sense because these are people who consider being left alone their political ideology. So how do you organize these independence-minded people to evangelize for a more free and powerful and sovereign Alberta? Well, someone has thought about that. Many of you know Corey Morgan as a columnist at both the Western Standard and at the Epoch Times. But in a former life, a long, long time ago, he was a candidate for an independence party here in Alberta. And since that time, Corey's given some real thought to his experience within the independence movement. And he's thought about how to chart a way forward. And he's written it all down in his new book, The Sovereigntist Handbook. So joining me now is Corey Morgan to discuss his brand new book, which, of course, I will link in the show notes so you can get your own copy. I'll ask him what he thinks about Danielle Smith's prospects for re-election with the NDP just crawling back out of the woodwork. And I want to ask him about how progressive policies are failing big cities all across the country. So check it out. This free episode of The Gun Show is brought to you by... Adam Sos here for Rebel News. You know, our company is growing quickly and we'd actually like for your company to grow too. That's why this ad space that I'm speaking through right now is actually available for you to purchase. So instead of people listening to me, they could actually be learning about your company, learning about your business. If this interests you, if this is an opportunity you'd like to capitalize on, send us an email at ads at rebelnews.com. So joining me now is author and columnist for both the Western Standard and Epoch Times, Corey Morgan. Corey, thanks for coming on the show. It's been a while since I had you on, and uh, that's to my great regret. But I wanted to have you on, first of all, to talk about your brand new book, uh, The Sovereigntist's Handbook. Looks like the books are already being shipped, which is fantastic. Um, but tell me why now you chose to write the book because you have a history in the sovereigntist movement that maybe people a little younger than me <laughs> don't really know, but sort of tell us why this book and why this book now? Uh, sure. Well, I, I think I, I'd finally gotten enough experience under my belt to be able to write something with authority and, and say, here's all the screw ups I did in the last 20 years pursuing independence. Let's not repeat them. So I, I, I can lend that experience in a book uh, as you said, for some who are younger who don't remember, I, I founded the Alberta Independence Party way back when I was 29 years old and, and ran it into the, the 20, 2001 election and, and Ralph Klein just mopped the floor with us. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I've learned a lot since then about political organizing in general. And uh, I mean, independent support is growing. It's growing all the time. It seems to be getting steadier and steadier, but no solid movement can seem to come together. And part of it is independence advocates aren't political advocates. They don't know. They're, they're running, you know, average Albertan, Saskatchewan resident species, and they haven't taken part in political parties. They haven't done advocacy. So what this book is more of a, a guide. I'm not trying to convert people to independent supporters. Uh, our government's already doing that all by themselves. Yeah. I'm just showing them, okay, you've decided it's time to go. This is some of the steps and how we can do it and how not to do it, which is, I think, more important almost. Yeah, I think you've got an uphill battle organizing separatists and independence-minded people, because I think your book isn't just for 
dyed in the wool separatists. I think it's more for people who want to sort of exert Alberta's power within Confederation in whatever way that looks like. But I think you have an uphill battle because you're dealing with people who, by nature, want to be left alone by everybody, the federal government, their neighbors, <laughs> other groups, yeah. you know, and, like th- that's their their mentality. That's why they're sovereigntists. So it's hard to organize them. And that's part of what the, the whole theme of this book is, is it's trying to train the individual. I, I've realized the futility of getting a whole bunch of independence minded people into one room and trying to make them walk together. So instead, I, I want to see thousands of individuals who are promoting it at the water cooler at work or around the dinner table at home. I mean, and I warn against being a, a fanatic in there as well. Hey, you don't want to lose your job or stop getting invited <laughs> to dinners. But there's ways you can be an effective advocate and grow that support on the ground because the party an overtly independence-minded party. And I know some of the people in the Independence Party of Alberta and one of the other five independence-minded parties of Alberta are going, won't work. Um, I mean, it it helps to advocate. The people aren't wasting their effort if they're in those parties, but you will not win an election with that front and center. You need to work within other parties and existing parties and you can build that support. And and I kind of chart that path within there. I think you have to be a realist too. You know, like uh, people who say, you know, we if we elect one independence minded MLA, we're leaving tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and there's, there's, there, there's a lot of stuff in between there that I feel like they might have skipped a step. There, there's a large section in there just under patience and just saying, I know you want out, you want out yesterday, but we've, we've really got to bide your time. This is the tipping point isn't there that there's people demanding we need to hold a referendum next month. Well, if you want to set it back 10 years, we can do that. But until there's actually that much of a a court for support, we aren't ready for a referendum. You need that base out there. And again, that's why we need to be a little more thoughtful with the pursuit to this. And yes, probably going to be a lot grayer before uh, the time gets here when there's actually a a lot of support for for independence, where you're looking at being on the verge of a successful referendum in any one of the provinces. But this is the way to get there. We've got to start building that ground support that won't go away. Parties come and go. Groups come and go. But if you can keep getting those independence by individuals, they stay. And and that that leads to things. Eventually, the parties follow the people. That's right. And I think independence is part of the culture here in Alberta. It's why people live here. It's why people settled here. Um, For that being left alone mentality, I think, you know, that does translate into a political movement. And whether the mainstream media likes it or not, people expressing separatist and independence minded ideas is actually pretty mainstream. It might be the one thing we probably all can sort of agree on. I've seen polls where, you know, and it it depends on how they would determine what is independent sentiment, but up to 50%, like one in two Albertans express some form of independent sentiment. That's pretty mainstream. That's more than vote for the UCP or more than vote for the NDP or, frankly, more than watch the mainstream media. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That that seed is there. And, and the definition varies. I mean, that can be from people saying, I just want the premier to stand up more strongly to us. There's some people saying we want out altogether and, and everything in between. Uh, but it, to, to express that and make Central Canada realize that this support is real, it is solid, and it could blossom from people who just want uh, a premier who's standing up to Ottawa into people who really want uh, confederation to be, to be dissolved. Uh, if Ottawa keeps pushing things the way they are, they can create that tipping point on their own. So, you know, this is a warning shot at the least. Now, I want to ask you because uh, I think the Sovereignty Act in Alberta might extinguish some of the separatist movement. Not that it would separate extinguish separatist mentality or independence mentality, but it's, I think, could serve to absorb some of those people back into the UCP after they saw Jason Kenney as just such a staunch federalist. And I think Danielle Smith is too, but she's at least doing something more than writing strongly worded letters to Justin Trudeau that Justin Trudeau throws in the garbage as soon as he gets them. Well, and and what we need is the fight. It, it, the thing is, sure, some people are going to say, oh, good, the Sovereignty Act, uh, Sovereignty Act will get us there. Well, people said that about the Alberta agenda. I write that in the book. And Stephen Harper and all the rest came out with all those planks in this Alberta agenda. And that really deflated the Alberta Independence Party that I was leading at that time. So, oh, we don't need this. Look at this. Stephen Harper and all these political scientists are going to fix it. 
And, and Harper, I mean, certainly was a good prime minister in many ways, didn't implement a single thing with his majority of that. So I, I think independence advocates got to realize we have to we have to hit our head on these walls a few more times before people realize it. So if the Sovereignty Act aspects of it work and Ottawa backs off, great. But if it doesn't work, that's where you start getting the more permanent supporters of, of independence movements and things such as that. It's when the conservatives fail that creates the long term. Uh, independent supporters, not with the Liberals, because we expect it to them. Now, uh, switching gears a little bit, I wanted to talk to you about your latest article in the Epoch Times, because you talk about the double standard within the judicial system and how different groups of people are treated within the legal system. And for me, it all sort of comes down to, you know, is this in the interest, which I think is how it should be, is prosecuting this crime in the interest of the public. And that's why I look at these COVID cases and say, well, Alberta is short. Some say 50 crown prosecutors. We don't have time to be wasting on COVID scoff laws when rapists and wife beaters and burglars are going to be walking free because they're, they sort of run out of the, they run out the clock on their prosecution. But it's more than that. As you point out in your article with Epoch times that they are choosing to specifically not prosecute certain things based on a political agenda. And very serious ones. Uh, the, the one that I started with was with a video, just because it was so stark of that gentleman going bananas on, a, on an anti-lockdown uh, demonstrator and smashing his vehicle with a bicycle and smashing the windows out of it. And you could see the, the, the uh, aggressor's face in clear detail. He was detained. And they decided, no, no, we don't think we can get a conviction. Oh, come on, you guys. Of course yeah. you could. This was violent. This was an angry man. This is a person who could be dangerous. We're not talking about a, a, a litter bug or something. And they said, no, we're not We're not going to touch that. Or the other one was that the case in the hospital with that woman who you know wasn't properly masked. Uh, the security guards take her around a corner. I mean, that was chilling. And then the video turns away from it. A security guard with a remote video turns the camera away. And then you see her prone body being led away. She was killed. Uh, no charges. Well, they, no, they're sorry. They were charged and the judge dismissed it. Said, right. no, we, we don't have something to go with this. And meanwhile, of course, the stark example of uh, Tamara Leach, where they just, they will not give up on, on this, this, uh, you know, harmless grandmother who, uh, again, fine, you, you can agree or disagree with the protest, but I mean, to keep her without bail for 40 days was ridiculous beyond the pale. And of course, they are not giving up on those charges. They are still after her with everything they got, that's politicization. That's not looking out for public safety. That's not prioritizing judicial cases based on what we need. That's a political agenda. That's saying you upset the balance and we're going to come after you with the full force of the law. And people should be pretty concerned when the justice system is doing that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the in Alberta, it's the same way. You know, you hear the mainstream media and I, I bang the gong of being critical of the mainstream media, but they really want to see Pastor Art Pulowski behind bars. They want to see the truckers at Coots behind bars. But yet they they turn a blind eye to the social decay happening in our big cities. And in fact, they're pro-enabling it. They're pro, you know, supervised injection sites and uh, not prosecuting shoplifting and burglary and car theft because meh, it's an insurance thing. Um doesn't make any sense, but at the end of the day, it serves to make our communities less less safe. Well, that's it. And if there's any, you know, I'm a libertarian minded person. I want the least amount of government in my yeah, life possible. <laughs> and one of the obligations, though, of having an organized state is at least public safety, you know, sparing us from I should be able to assaulted or robbed or threatened by people. And we are seeing a complete collapse of that in, in the urban centers of Calgary, Edmonton, even Lethbridge. And as you said, the, the legacy media is saying, ah, don't sweat that sort of thing. Uh, meanwhile, the downtowns are turning almost dystopian. I mean, it, and it's it, this willful blindness is almost shocking. You look at city councils. Do, we don't know why there's nobody riding transit any longer. In a Calgary, they tried a karaoke bus there. See, you can sing karaoke on the ride. It didn't work. It's because nobody wants to get on transit surrounded by junkies and potentially robbed. They're having flare gun fights in the transit stations and, and media saying, look the other way. Yeah, um, I, I talk about it all the time on our live stream at Rebel News, the great work of Arthur C. Green uh, from the Western Standard. And yeah, he comes from, you know, the Maritimes, 
Bonneville to Edmonton, downtown Edmonton. And his Twitter feed is just a documentation of the human suffering of Edmonton's downtown core. And you see uh, Pierre Polyev sort of coming under fire by progressives for saying that East Hastings is hell on earth. But that hell on earth is not confined to Vancouver. It is spreading in the major progressive cities in this country. I saw an article the other day and I it stuck with me because it was so crazy. The headline was something akin to the people sleeping in the TTC are concerned about their safety because of the gangs also in the TTC stations. And I thought, this is this is crazy. This is crazy that we have a group of people who are already living in the TTC stations in Toronto feeling threatened by the gangs and everybody just thinks this is normal. Yeah, and we can't accept this. And, and again, this is these are public services in Toronto and Calgary that people want to ride on. They're paying, and some people don't have a choice. If they're low income, they got to go to work. They've got to get onto these these hellish trains and these stations and deal with this. Uh, there was a, a lot of noise over in Calgary during a cold snap. Uh, somebody took a video of, of a bunch of uh, addicts being kicked off of a, a train. And oh, the hell! Oh, you're killing these people. No, they actually have shuttles at every station that will bring them to a warm shelter. The facilities are there. Quit pretending they aren't there. We can't let them turn our transit systems into safe injection sites and homeless shelters. And that's what's happening. And I, I wrote about that in the Epic Times as well, actually, in a different column. With the, the policies of, of enablement are failing, and we see the numbers already. Portland tried this. Their, their overdoses went through the roof. BC is trying this sort of thing. Their overdoses. I mean, that's a good measure of it. Alberta, to give Jason Kenny credit, yep. took a very strong treatment approach. And we're starting to see the results of it. Overdoses fell by almost 50% in Alberta, and they're still dropping. Why can't the media and these enablers look at the numbers? Just look at the numbers. If you care about these people, this is what's working. Not enablement, treatment. And uh, they, they still won't accept it. Yeah, I don't know why any politician, I'm looking at you, Rachel Notley, would look at downtown Vancouver and think, that thing that they've been doing for almost 30 years there of enabling drug addiction, turning a blind eye and even giving out drugs and needles. How can you look at the downtown east side and say that that is some sort of success? Whether these people die today or tomorrow, we are enabling their slow suicide by not offering them treatment. I think any family that's been touched by addiction, and I think most families probably are, know that one of the things you're told is to not enable the addiction. Let them hit rock bottom. They will come for help or they will never hit rock bottom. But you can't intervene until they hit rock bottom. And now we have the state making sure that nobody ever hits that place. No, and I, I saw a piece on, uh, again, one of the legacy media TV sites where they showed a, a young lady was talking about how the, the safe consumption sites are so important to her because she can go for her day. She can go in, get her fix in the morning, go to work for the day and come back and get another fix. And you see, she could live a life perfectly fine as a full out addict of fentanyl, just as long as she can safely consume and get a free supply. That's ridiculous. That's absurd. It is bizarre. This is a, a young woman who is on the track to death. That doesn't matter if she has a safe consumption. They, they're trying to give the impression that you can just live functionally on this. I mean, I'll admit the candid thing. I've had a bad relationship with alcohol. I, I haven't had a drink in years now, but it took a, a lot of work and a lot of efforts and a whole lot of support meetings and all that to get dry. And uh, yeah, you don't go to an AA meeting and have them hand out shooters and say, well, we'll just talk about it and let you get drunk while we, uh, uh, you know, until you're ready. Or you that term of a functional alcoholic. No, a functional alcoholic is just somebody who hasn't hit bottom yet. They're going to eventually. And it can be tragic, particularly with things like meth and fentanyl, some of the things that the, the addicts are, are, are stuck with right now. And, and, and they're trying to normalize this. I mean, we don't want to demonize it. They are sick people. I agree. Yeah. And they need treatment. And they need help. And you can't force it. You have to wait until they're ready. But let's not pretend they can live like that because they can't. You're, that's just, as you said, slow death. That's all it is. Yeah. Uh, they call it safe consumption, but there's nothing safe about doing illicit drugs. And it is true. They call it compassion, but it's really not. It's brutality. What they are allowing these people to do to themselves, but also what the state and uh, progressives are participating in allowing them to do to themselves. But I look at every one of these addicts and I see them as a black hole sucking everybody around them into it. There's 
there are families, there are kids, there are parents who are saying, we need to get them help. But the state only wants to offer them more of that, which they're using to kill themselves. Yeah, and it's a catastrophe and it's unforgivable. And, and I actually know now uh, three different uh, parents who have lost children to overdoses. It, it, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. These are from middle class, stable yep. families. It can happen to anybody. It can happen to your uncle. It can happen to your nephew. It can happen to your children. I mean, I don't want to come down on the addicts. However they got there, it's an unfortunate yep. thing. But we need a realistic approach to trying to help and save these people. And enablement is failing. It's 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 proven to be failing. And still our civic initials, uh, officials won't admit it. You know, and on the flip side of that, where they put these supervised injection sites. As you rightly point out, addiction touches across all social demographics. You don't start off in East Hastings. Often you just end up there. You don't start off in downtown Edmonton. You just end up there eventually. Um, But they like to put these supervised injection sites in neighborhoods that are trying to shake off the scourge of gangs and drugs. Chinatown in Edmonton is a great example of this. They are doing their best to clean up their their community. They they don't want the drug addicts there. They don't want the prostitutes there. But municipal officials keep shoehorning all these uh, facilities into these recovering neighborhoods, put them in the mayor's backyard. Because kids in that social demographic are also susceptible to this. Put them there. When they get dosed with fentanyl, there will be a place for them too. Yeah, well, there's, there's multiple problems with those those consumption sites. They become hubs for the consumers, the ones who will go to them. Yeah, at least if anyways. you build it, they will come, as they say. Yeah. And the dealers will follow them and the yep. crime associated with it comes along because you need to pay the dealer. Well, I'm going to rob the nearest place I can. And I mean, it becomes a social hangout. You go to the Calgary one, the Sheldon Tumor Center, and you see them consuming a block away. Well, they don't want to bother going in. They've got their drugs. This is just where we like to hang out now. Yeah. And uh, I, I spoke with uh, well, like Dr. Ghosh, I believe his name was, uh, on one of my shows. And, and uh, he admitted, uh, you know, if it's beyond 500 meters, it's not effective. Like the addicts will only travel so far to get a safe injection. They're not going to cross the city and you can't have one every 500 meters. You, you, you just can't have it. So again, this, this stop gap at best is not a, a sustainable solution to anything. And, and Calgary was going to move one to the East village, the, the area that the city council really wants to turn into a trendy neighborhood. And that's really divided the community because it's kind of a lot of hipsters and folks down there. But once they found out well, we're going to move the safe consumption site to your area, they got to, no, 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 not my place. Well, hang on then. You know, <laughs> you talk one way, but again, as you said, not in the mayor's backyard, not in Notley's backyard, uh, but just as long as somebody else has to deal with it, we, we want to support these sites. It's, it's, it's hypocritical. Yeah, it's your car that can get stolen, <laughs> not theirs. Yeah. Um, now, speaking of Notley, um, Looking toward this spring's election, I see Notley like the round hog has poked her head up and she has seen her shadow and it's going to be six solid weeks of Notley trying to gaslight us on what we know about her track record when she was premier. Um, The one that we were talking about before we started recording was the nautical um, nautical. It's the methanol plant in Grand Prairie. And it was a $4 billion project, just fell apart. It was going to be 5,000 construction jobs. And the company is saying it's because of Justin Trudeau's net zero policies that we couldn't make the numbers work anymore. And Notley's solution was, why didn't Daniel Smith just bail them out? Um, So I guess now she's pro giving energy companies a bunch of money. Um, to, to bail them out as long as it allows her to attack Daniel Smith. Uh, what do you think Notley's prospects are uh, to uh, form the next government? Well, I, I never want to underestimate them because, you know, if it had been enough years ago and somebody said the NDP are going to form right. government in Alberta, I would have said, why? You, you need treatment yourself. You obviously been smoking <laughs> something bad. And I would have been wrong. So, yeah. I mean, we can, I will not say it's impossible for her to get back in, but from what I can see right now, they are actually flailing. I, I, I mean, they, they're, they're, as you said, they're gaslighting, they're opposing everything, whether it makes sense or it doesn't make sense. They're just shooting out in all directions and hoping something sticks. And, and that sort of tactic, 
I don't think it's becoming very effective, really. I, I, people eventually just stop taking them seriously. They, they've got to start uh, coming up with a plan. I, I saw a progressive uh, a column from somebody saying, you know, we, we, it's saying from Denali, like, I want to vote for you, but you've got to start telling me what you're going to do, not just why Daniel Smith is bad. So unless they pivot and find themselves somehow, I don't think I, I, I still think we're pretty confident that Daniel Smith could win this sprint. Yeah, you know, I I think Jason Kenny didn't do Daniel Smith any favors. I think he hung on too long. And so that shortened her runway to normalize herself as the leader. Um, because, you know, she's making a lot of changes or she's trying to make a lot of changes. And you need to give the worried public, the people who are still on a little bit too much CBC, to realize that she can make these changes and the world doesn't end. But I don't think Jason Kenny left her a lot of time to have people's sort of nerves settle down after they've been worried by, uh, does CBC even have a six o'clock news in Alberta anymore? I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think Jason Kenny left her enough room uh, to really let people know who and what she is. She's sort of currently being defined by her enemies in the mainstream media, but I, I it wasn't, it was not that long ago that Rachel Notley was in charge and she was like a scarecrow for, for oil patch investment. And I think right now things are looking pretty good in the oil patch. Things are humming along. I guess war will do that <laughs> in the, the oil industry. But um, I don't, th- I, I'm, you know, I, I'm not always confident in my fellow uh, citizens, but I think Albertans are smart enough to not do that to ourselves again. I, I really think so. And I mean, the, the, the pushing the narrative, again, the establishment desperately does not oh. want to see Premier Smith get reelected. They're terrified. And because of that, as you said, because she actually wants to change things. But the public has had a recent taste of, of Premier Notley. And even if they're uncomfortable with, with, with Premier Smith, uh, when push comes to shove at voting time, particularly, again, when you look at the way the seats are laid out, uh, they might lose a few seats, but all she really needs is a handful in Calgary, and I'm pretty confident they should be able to get them. Uh, Rachel Notley's going to find herself in the opposition again. And, and, and it's unfortunate that it was so bitter. Uh, with Kenny, when he left, they kind of went with a scorched earth approach uh, on his way out the door and hung on to the bitter end. But as time is passing, people are realizing, despite what the legacy media is telling you, despite the shrill union calls, uh, Smith isn't the devil. She's, she's not insane. And uh, the world won't end if she gets a, a four-year term as premier. From your lips to God's ears. Uh, Corey, <laughs> I've taken up a bunch of your time already. Uh, oh, why don't sorry. you tell us how people can A, find your work, and B, find your book? Certainly. Well, I mean, uh, yes, I'm uh, at the Western Standard. I have a, a weekly show there as well on all those social media channels. And I write regular columns as well as uh, the Epic Times. I, I write uh, columns typically weekly there. I'm always on Twitter, if you really want to get into it with me at Corey B. Morgan, that's my favorite playground. And uh, the book, yes, The Sovereignist's Handbook, my, my first uh, publication there. And it's at uh, gvlbooks.com. Or if you just search out coreymorgan.com, of course, I'll be promoting and putting links out all the time for it. Perfect. And I'll make sure that I put a link in the show notes so that people can click directly through and order. You know what? I want a hard copy. I have the ebook, but I think I want the hard copy and I'll have to track you down and get a signature. I'll get one up your way. Perfect. (laughs) Corey, thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Sheila. This free episode of The Gun Show is brought to you by my mug. I know. It's pretty cool. So is this hoodie I got on and you could have it on too if you check out our special website at rebelnewsstore.com. That's where you can see freedom focus hoodies that we have for you, beanies, cell phone cases, you name it, all while supporting our journalism where we fight to bring you the other side of the story as opposed to, you know, being forced by the Trudeau government to fund leftist media out of your taxes. The truth is... Without you and your generosity, there is no Rebel News. So again, if you like the reports that we bring you and that we also fight for freedoms in Canada, please consider doing some shopping, picking up some swag at rebelnewsstore.com. We appreciate your support.
Well, friends, we've come to the portion of the show, as always, where we welcome your viewer feedback. You see, on like the mainstream media, I actually care about what you think about the work that we do here at Rebel News, and I want to hear from you. Now, one of the best ways to get in touch with me is to send me an email to Sheila at rebelnews.com. That goes directly to my email inbox. But if you could do me a favor, put gun show letters in the subject line so it's a little easier for me to find because I get dozens, sometimes hundreds of emails a day. But also don't hesitate to leave us a comment over on Rumble, YouTube, wherever you find us. Sometimes I go looking over there too for viewer feedback as well. Now, today's letter comes to me from Catherine who writes, I love your work and listen to your show all the time. Well, thank you so much. I work as an equipment sales consultant in Manitoba in May of 2020. I found myself without a job and I applied for EI benefits. So sounds like Catherine didn't go the CERB route. She figured I paid into EI. I should draw EI. Fair enough. I was automatically sent CERB, even though they knew that I wouldn't be on CERB long enough to pay back the $2,000 repayment. I wasn't consulted about this or even told that I would need to pay back what I didn't pay already. The government is now coming after me for $1,000 that, again, I wasn't told about. They call me every week, and sometimes twice a week, even though I have told them multiple times that I won't be paying them a single cent. The government wants to claw back $1,000 from a hardworking woman who has done nothing wrong wrong except go to work every day and pay my taxes. I find this so wrong and an immoral policy that added it to the list of reasons why I don't trust the government. Again, I love what you do, and I'm happy to see a woman as strong in character as yourself fighting for the freedom of all Canadians. Thanks for the opportunity to air my grievances. Sincerely, Katie. Well, you know what? It's astounding to me that the government would go after you when they gave you a benefit you didn't apply for. Now they want it back. But I see reports in the media right now, and when I say the media, I actually mean credible media, like uh, Black Locks Reporter, where the government is saying these CERB payments obtained by fraud, we're not going to bother chasing those down. Or these CERB payments we sent to people who were guests of federal penitentiaries, we're not going to try to get those back. It's just a little bit too much work. But they can find the time to harass someone like you over a $1,000. Talk about misplaced priorities. It's gross. Well, everybody, that's the show for tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see everybody back here in the same time, in the same place next week. And remember, don't let the government tell you that you've had too much to think.